counterfactuals, the recurring inaccuracies of movies and television. We've all seen them and we all know what's wrong, but still. Have you ever wanted to tell those would-be Mythbusters? Okay, I get it. I do see what's wrong here. I understand why it doesn't work. I really get it. But what if it were real? What else would change and how would it work? Well, I don't know if you ask those questions, but I do. I'm your nerdy host, Katie Hoffman, and I invite you to join me in not just examining, but celebrating our counterfactuals. And today, we'll be looking at a time-honored plot device, acid. Uh, n not that kind of acid, the other acid. <laughs> There you go! Yes, if you took even basic chemistry as a kid, you know that acids break things down. We have acid in our stomach that breaks down food, we have acid rain that breaks down buildings, and we can get burned from having acid on our skin. But as fascinating and potentially dangerous as acids are, they don't quite work the way that they do in the movies, do they? I could bombard you with statistics about this one, but I think it's going to be more fun to just tell you the story of my first year O-Chem lab. You see, acids are an important part of organic chemistry. A lot of our organic molecules aren't really that reactive until you have an acid or base come in and start shuffling electrons around. So in Ochem Lab, we were working with concentrated sulfuric acid, way more acidic than battery acid, eh, every two weeks or so. Now, of course, pretty much everyone is going to have this particular experience if they work in this sort of lab setting. You tear your glove a little bit, and you realize five minutes later when it starts to sting, oh, some of the acid got through, and it's burning me. And then you go over to the sink, you rinse it for a few minutes, and lo and behold, my finger is still there. There's not even a scar from it. But as we all know from watching Mythbusters, it's go big or go home. So now I will share with you the much bigger story of this one guy in my class. The guy who always showed up high. I don't actually remember anyone's name from this course, so I'm just going to call him Proby. It's real funny, Tony. Yeah. Anyway, we were working on this one project where basically we had this little round flask full of a lot of sulfuric acid and a little bit of reactant. We were heating it in this dark sort of, it was called a mantle, little heat cave. But we were watching for a color change. So every few minutes we would have to pick it up and hold it around eye level and keep swirling and try to see if the color had changed at all. Well, Proby had a little bit of trouble swirling his flask. He poured the boiling sulfuric acid all over his face. And it gets worse because Proby was not wearing his safety goggles. Don't be like Proby, kids. Don't be like Proby. Well, the teacher rushed poor Proby over to the showers and flushed his face and eyes with water for a good 10 minutes. And the rest of us went back to work because we had grades to earn and teachers to impress. Such is life. But Proby, by the end of class, was back in discussion. And yes, he had been burned. He had the mother, it looked like the mother of all sunburns in this weird splatter shape all over his face. And I bet it hurt, and it took weeks to heal. But his entire face was definitely still there. Now, before we go and start putting battery acid on everything, yes, acids are corrosive. They are dangerous. They can dissolve metal and flesh. And these reactions often release a lot of heat and gases, so there's even bubbling and fumes. Notice that in both of these stories, we rinsed the acid off as soon as we realized it was there. Why? 
because if we hadn't, yeah, eventually we would have been missing some skin. But it would take a while. And that's really where movie acids and real acids differ. The number of things they corrode, the speed at which they do it, and the fact that the corroded material just sort of vanishes. So how would we make this stuff work? Well, acids and bases, which are equally corrosive, and we'll talk more about them later, are pretty versatile as reactants. Basically, acids pull electrons away from atoms that have a lot of electrons, and bases sort of share electrons with atoms that don't have a lot of electrons. And this weakens the bonds within the molecule, or it helps metals ionize so that they can be soluble. As it turns out, a lot of materials, particularly the ones that make up living things, have those atoms that acids and bases can trigger. But not every molecule has these. For instance, glass and concrete, they're pretty stable in their makeup, so how do you put them on the acid-base hit list? Well, to answer that, let's first take a look at the second part of our counterfactual. Corrosion happens instantaneously. Well, the thing is, acid and base reactions, they release a lot of energy. You have to be careful about holding them because they will heat up. So you're going from a high energy state to a low energy state, which is very, very thermodynamically favorable. Basically, nature is lazy. So if it's so favorable to complete these reactions, why are they slow? Well, in the grand scheme of chemical reactions, they aren't slow. When you're doing the organic chemistry work, it's usually those acids and bases that do the fast part of the reaction, and then you're waiting around forever for the organic molecules to get their act together. That's what will keep you waiting for two hours in every single OCHEM lab. But when we're looking at the Hollywood situations, we're expecting a fairly small amount of acid to eat through a ton of stuff that's got very, very low surface to mass ratio and to do it like that. So the odds are kind of stacked against our chemical onslaught how do we get things in our favor? Well, in order to address this, I'm going to share with you some equations. No, no, get back here. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to do math. You don't have to do math. We're not even going to analyze them that in depth. We're just going to talk about them. No math, I promise. Okay? Look at this. This equation, the rate equation, has been experimentally derived, and what it does is it allows us to calculate how fast our reaction is going to go based on some of the natural variables of our reaction. So our output is this guy R over here, and R is just how fast our acid is eating through our stuff. So then, what determines R? Well, let's look at these guys in brackets. These are how much acid and how much stuff we have in terms of concentration. And for this argument here, I'm going to consider surface area that's exposed to be kind of like the solids version of concentration. Anyway, we have our acid and our stuff. And that's pretty much set, you know, comparing between Hollywood and the real world. Yeah, we want this amount of acid to dissolve this amount of stuff. So how do we make that rate so much bigger for the Hollywood example than it is for the real world one? Let me introduce one more player from this equation, K. K is simply known as the rate constant. And the rate constant determines for our given concentrations how much of a rate are we going to get. Now, K is something that's specific to every reaction individually, and of course, K has its very own equation. All right, this is K's equation, the Arrhenius equation. And I know that it's a little more complicated. Look, you got temperature, you got constants, you got um, E to the something, but we're only really going to look at one variable out of this whole Nash. 
This guy in red here, EA, that's our activation energy. And that's kind of like a head charge where you have to put in a certain amount of energy into your system before any reaction will start. It destabilizes bonds, helps things get into their transition states so the reaction can proceed. What this equation is telling us then is that if we want our reactions to be able to go a lot faster by having this bigger K, what we need to do is we need to make our EA, our activation energy, smaller. We need to make those bonds easier to break. All right, the equations are gone. I'm not going to bring them back. And here is what they've all been leading up to. So we can increase our range of corrodible substances and speed up reactions if we can make all the atoms in our molecules give less of a crap about each other. If our bonds are a lot weaker, we can break them faster and more easily. And bonds that are normally too stable to break are suddenly on the table. Even further, if we can break every bond in our target substance and not just the ones that were originally vulnerable, there's less of this semi-solid byproduct to make a sludge. It accounts for all three aspects of our counterfactual. Hollywood bonds just need to be a lot weaker than real world bonds. That's all. Now, on to the implications. Probably the oldest implication is the issue of containing these things. And we have been snarking about this, well, at least since the days when we thought alchemy would work. And alchemists were looking for the universal solvent, the substance that could dissolve anything. So you know how we all feel kind of clever and original when we say, hey, genius, how would you store that stuff? People have been saying that since at least the 16th century. And to be honest, I still don't know the answer. The containers that we see holding this stuff aren't really different from our real containers even though the same materials are instantly dissolved if it's not their container. I really don't know how to get around this issue. If you have an idea, tell me in the comments, please. What do you mean? Destruction and creation are two sides of the same coin. You must destroy to create. That is the law of the universe. That is so much worse than the pink elephants. Now, moving on. One of the funny parts about our weaker molecular bonds is that they wouldn't just lead to more efficient corrosion. Every reaction would be so much easier and so much faster. And this could account for the enviable speed of all Hollywood chemical reactions. And if the re reactions are reducing a lot of heat and we're releasing more heat per second because we've sped up our reaction, yeah, there would be more bubbling and exploding than we see in the real world. Hollywood chemistry would now make sense. And even mutations would be a lot easier because of the weaker bonds. What I still can't account for is the strange effects of those reactions and mutations. You dropped me into that vat of chemicals. That wasn't easy to get over. Don't think that I didn't try. I know you did. <clears throat> of course, industrial facilities and research labs would be so much more dangerous. But to be honest, I don't think I can highlight these hazards better than Hollywood does. So let's get on to the really horrible part about this counterfactual. It would be so much easier to get away with murder. Now the idea of destroying a dead body by dissolving it in acid is not a new idea. Serial killers like John George Hay, Javed Iqbal, and even Jeffrey Dahmer have used this method. As have dozens of our favorite TV characters. And now that we're on the subject of dead bodies, I think it's time to bring back those bases. As you can see here, a strong acid and a strong base are pretty evenly matched when it comes to dissolving something like aluminium, which is equally vulnerable to either acid or base. The interesting thing comes when you start using them on organic tissues. You see, living organisms, including humans, produce a lot of acids in the reactions that keep them running. Not only that, but a lot of the materials that make us up, like the amino acids in proteins and the fatty acids in all our lipids, yeah, they're acidic. So 
we have little mop-up reactions and buffers going on to clean up the acids we make, and our general chemistry is weighted towards acids. So when you introduce a base, the tissue, whether it's dead or alive, isn't really equipped to deal with that. That's why bases taste so horrible. They're poisonous to us. So if you really want to dissolve organic tissue, it's hard to go wrong with a good base. So whether you go the acid route or the base route, the main drawback to this method of corpse disposal, aside from the paper trail left in acquiring the acid or base in the first place, is that it's slow. The body takes a few days to dissolve completely, give or take depending on how big a person you killed and how many pieces you cut them into. And while it is dissolving, it reeks and it draws suspicion from your neighbors. I knew there was something dubious going on here. And even when you finally manage to dissolve the body, you don't get sort of this nice fluid that you can just dump easily. You get sludge. And this sludge might have little scraps of bone that weren't completely dissolved. And if someone finds them, they will know it's part of the cover up. And that sludge. Yes, you can put it down the toilet and get rid of it. But if you do it a lot, it will start to damage your plumbing. And if you think your plumbing will keep your secrets, check out how we caught a guy named Dennis Nilsson. So with our rapid all dissolving Hollywood acids, that wouldn't be a problem anymore. All you have to do is dissolve your corpse outside when there aren't people around and because it will dissolve in a few minutes instead of a few days, you can get it out of the way without anyone seeing it and without anyone smelling it. See, when you're doing a rapid reaction out in open air, all the fumes and odors disperse really quickly. And then you just slap a lid on, take it down to the dump, and it's just one more barrel of chemical waste. Voila, the evidence of your crime is gone. But there's a funny twist to this sordid tale. This actually wouldn't have too much effect on serial killers. See, practical killers like Walter, or people who only wanted to murder one person or didn't even mean to kill anyone, they're going to just plain get rid of all the evidence with our fabulous wonder acids and be done with it and start working on their cover story. Serial killers, on the other hand, who are mostly doing this for fun or for some sort of vendetta or questionable belief system, they actually collect a lot of evidence and just hang on to it. They take trophies from the bodies. They take pictures, horrible, disturbing pictures. They document what they've done. They play games with police. Even if they are very hard to catch, once you've caught them, there's evidence. You don't necessarily need to have the body. And in all honesty, while this counterfactual rocks for people on the dark side, helping them to commit crimes and dispose of evidence, it isn't that fun for the rest of us. Really, all that's happened is we've made our labs and industrial facilities so much more dangerous. And by the way, if someone we love is murdered, we have a smaller chance of ever recovering their body to mourn. So, while I do deeply love this counterfactual for all its epic destruction, its amazing visuals, the way it drives plots, I think we're probably better off in the real world. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this video. I just wanted to let you know that there are going to be some extra links in the description this time. And these are resources for those of us who might be dealing with a mental health problem or any sort of abuse. And I'm putting them here because I spent so much of the video talking about violence, murder, how to cover up a murder, what a serial killer's mind might be like. And it's all very interesting and it's an interesting part of the counterfactual, but it's a terrible, terrible solution in the real world. So whenever I discuss bloodshed, um, yeah, I want to provide people who are dealing with a tough situation with some more concrete and likely to be successful options for finding help. So again, these will be in the description. And if you think you might have any need for them for yourself or for someone close to you, take a look. 
Well, I wish you guys all the best, and if you like this video, please rate and subscribe. And if you hated this video, you know what the internet needs? A flame war about the socio-political bitchiness of putting equations in a YouTube video. How horribly discriminatory! You know you can make it work. Otherwise, I'll see you next time on Counterfactuals.